Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt land. My name is Ron Kettleson. I'm president of the Sharon Historical Society. And on behalf of our uh, group, we'd like to thank you for participating tonight in our Underground Railroad program. We're really excited to have Ken Jones with us. Ken is the town and village historian of Esperance, New York. He's written several books on local history, including Sam Sam the Gallo Bird. It's a story of a uh, Schoharie black resident who was hung for murder in Bond in New York in 1878. Ken is a charter member uh, and currently the president of the Esperance Historical Society and Museum. Ken is also the chairman of the Commission on Archives and History for the Upper New York Conference of the United Methodist Church. And he's currently working part-time for procurement services at the University of Albany SUNY. So we're really excited to have Ken tonight and uh, Ken, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and you can go ahead and share yours and go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, well, welcome to Exploring the Underground Railroad in Scary County. Um, we're going to start by uh, looking at a map of Scary County so you get an idea. It's kind of in central New York State. Um, the original settlers of Scary County were uh, Palatine Germans. They were basically brought over um, from England um, as indentured servants to make military stores to pay off their trip uh, from England to the colonies um, in 1710 and then came to Schaharie um, after um, there was uh, the finances had dried up for the project and they were left on their own. Uh, they decided that uh, Schoharie was the promised land that they had been promised um, by the Queen of England and um, settled here, uh, but did not have proper property rights. And that had been a long time dispute. So the Palatines came here and they're always referred to as the, the poor Palatines, but they're also the Dutch, the Romans that settled around the same time um, that were um, had wealth and uh, basically um, had slaves that they brought with them, where it would be uh, quite some time uh, before the Palatines would have had money uh, to do that. Now, as we look at the, the lay of the land here, we see Schoharie um, is next to Albany County. We're about 25 miles uh, from the capital city. Um, down below, we see um, on the southeast, we're next to Green County, and on the um, southwest, um, we have Delaware County, uh, the directly west is Otsego, north is Montgomery, and northeast is Schenectady. Um, to get a feel for, you know, what did the historians say about Scurry County and slavery, um, we're going to start out with Jephthah Sims, who was a famous historian in these uh, parts. And um, in 1845, he was basically saying that um, you know, they looked, uh, they were treated as a member of the family. And um, if you didn't notice the color, you would think uh, they were treated equally um, as any other member of the family would have been. Most of the Schoharie families, um, of course, um, did not have large plantations, but small farms of around 100 acres. Because the Palatines were not um, affluent. Um, they didn't have slaves when they first settled here around 1712. The Dutch, the Romans, and the other families brought um, their slaves with them. But the Palatines, right up until about 1760, were pretty um, financially strapped and just trying to make their way. Um, there's a lot of, of history behind 
land disputes and problems the Palatines had. And they're always called, referred to as the poor Palatines, even, you know, back when they, before they came over here. Um, so they were no different here. They were poor off. And here we see John Peter Niskern, one of the, uh, what is called list masters um, who settled Niskernsdorf. Um, he was called a list master because he was responsible um, at the camps on the Hudson where they're supposed to be making military stores. He was in charge of their supplies and tools and, and supervision. Um, but when he moved to the Scary Valley um, in 1746, um, he made out his will. And in his will, um, he doesn't even own a wheeled carriage um, and there are no slaves yet. Um, in his will. Um, to give another idea so that they could afford a slave, um, the early Palatines didn't have horses either. And there's a whole story about how they acquired a horse and there's a little story book that's been written on they had a horse. And basically they shared the ownership of that horse. And here we see um, a person by the name of Swart, uh, Josiah Swart, who's selling his one third ownership um, and a female slave and her child. So in order to afford a slave, they went in on a partial ownership here. Here you had three partners uh, sharing the ownership of one a female slave and her child. William Roscoe, another historian of Scurry County, um, he wrote the Negroes of both sexes were admitted into the family uh, which belonged um, upon equal footing with the white members and appreciated the kindness shown to them by their masters. So we're getting the idea that uh, the slaves in Scary County didn't have it too bad. They're treated, you know, as one of the families. We know the Dutch in particular, um, when they took over um, basically New York, when they settled New York, um, that the slaves were in a better um, standing in the community than when the English took over um, and became more uh, of uh, more of a uh, what do you want to call a property than a person. Now, we just got through saying how um, the historians are telling us that they were treated as a member of the family. And here we see a story of the old Roman house in Schoharie, which is still a show place near the uh, historic uh, stone fort in Schoharie and the newly built uh, covered bridge that's there. And they say uh, one of the women in Peter of Roman's house uh, in a fit of temper uh, pushed a slave girl down the cellar steps. And as a slave fell, she struck her head on the masonry and died. It wasn't long before um, the scary slaves were also running away. They weren't waiting for the Underground Railroad. Um, they were taking flight um, to gain their own freedom. Um, and here in 1774, we see a typical um, advertisement of a runaway slave. Some had a lot of money, uh, depending on the value they had of the slave. Some were very small, but sometimes they place the ad just to be on the safe side in case the slave incurred any debts. It wouldn't come back onto them because they placed a notice that the slave had run away. And this particular um, slave looks like um, it was a slave that was pretty well dressed, possibly a house servant. Most of the Schoharie uh, families, if they had a slave, only had one or two slaves. Um, and they're very expensive, um, as noted. Um, this one was evidently dressed well and had plated buckles um, on their good shoes. Here is another runaway slave notice. This one's a lot later. This one is actually from Albany in 1812. And we notice in this slave ad um, for a runaway slave um, that the slave ran away with an infant um, named Diana. And she'd asked permission to visit her children in Scary County, which was granted to her. So this tells you that the families were being separated. It wasn't like um, you know, the, um, they kept their families together. They were being sold and separated. Here we see that um, the slave Fan is trying to um, gain her freedom by telling her, her master that she wants to visit her children um, that were separated from her in Schoharie. It's hard to come up with the firsthand accounts of slaves in New York State, especially in this region. Um, because of course they couldn't read or write. 
Um, but Thomas James um, was uh, a literate and uh, well, um, well known minister. Um, and basically he grew up in Canajoharie, which is north of where I am here in Square Ray County. Um, and in Canajoharie, he was born in 1804. And he talks about the fact that he was um, a slave and that his mother um, and sister, and actually his, his brother as well, um, were sold away. And her, his mother, to get away from the uh, people that were going to buy her, ran up into what they called the garret, what we would call the attic, and tried to hide there. Uh, but they found her and tied her up and uh, put her uh, with the new owner. And that's the last that uh, Thomas James saw of his mother and sister and never saw them again. Afterwards, he mentions that he was sold with the rest of the property after his master died in an accident. And his new master owned him but a few months when he was sold, or rather traded, to George Hess of Fort Plain, which is also in Montgomery County. He says, I was bartered for a yoke of steers, a colt, and some additional property. Later, he says, which is very important to uh, think about when we um, read about or catch on to little clues to do with the Underground Railroad. Um, again, it was an illegal, illegal activity. They didn't have, you know, signs out that this is a, uh, you know, place that uh, is a safe house, uh, just like when they had prohibition, you know, you had to know someone um, in order to get a drink in the same way here, you had to know your way through uh, to get safely uh, to freedom. Uh, but he mentions that uh, Mr. Hess was going to whip him. And uh, to avoid the whipping, he ran away and followed the newly staked trail of the Erie Canal. So the Erie Canal was being built around um, 1817 until about 1821 or so, and then opened fully in 1825. So he was um, probably, if he was 17, he was, that makes it 1821. So somewhere around 1825, he was probably following the newly staked trail of the Erie Canal. Now the Erie Canal runs from Albany to Buffalo. Uh, this is another uh, sale of a slave. Now, um, this particular uh, sale was um, between uh, a Mr. Cottle and a Joshua Reed. Now they're both from, this happens to be from 1822, uh, kind of late um, in the process uh, of slavery in New York. Um, but what is interesting is that Joshua Reed um, was the uncle um, of a prominent uh, person in his family um, that wanted to uh, get a teaching job. So he um, arranged for his niece uh, to get a teaching job in Canada Harry. And his niece was none other than Susan B. Anthony. Um, and of course, she became later on a famous a suffragette and also an abolitionist. But her uncle uh, was the opposite. He was, a, he was dealing in slaves here in 1822. He had already sold a male, male slave. And here he's um, buying a slave um, named Marianne. We're going to talk now about gradual abolition in New York, um, starting, as you see in this um, slide, um, 1781 is when they started with the um, manumitting of slaves, that means the freeing of slaves um, after they served in the military, and then there was a law passed about exporting and importing slaves into New York State. And um, when slaves were freed by their master, some laws required them to provide a bond. In other words, if they were trying to dispose of a slave, for example, that it aged out and was no longer of value, um, this prevented them from doing that and having that slave become a burden um, to the poor master or to the municipality. So they would have to come up with a bond um, if they were going to manumit a slave. Later that was changed and in 1799, we start with the first real um, gradual emancipation acts. And this one um, in 1799 allowed for males uh, to be freed um, after they've 
served their master and are at the age of 28 and females to the age of 25 and indentured servants to the age of 21. Now indentured servants could also be orphans and people that have been assigned to um, a journeyman of some kind and learn a trade uh, that no longer had parental support and the poor master had put them with someone and they were an indentured servant. As part of the legislation in 1799 for the gradual emancipation of slaves in New York, um, it allowed um, the slaveholder to um, basically um, put up um, any uh, unwanted slave child uh, with the overseer of the poor to become a pauper of that particular town. Um, because what would happen is they would be raising a slave um, and then eventually when the slave was of age, it would be free so they wouldn't get the value of the slave. So this was a way for the New York state government to kind of offset the financial loss of, of the act they passed in 1799. But also what it meant was the state was paying about $2 a month um, and a, uh, a mother could lose her slave child without any say so in the matter. And that slave child could be put with someone else and that someone else would receive the $2 a month. Now, a lot of times they had trouble finding a place for the slave child. So it was put back with the original farmer. And this continued to about 1806 when it became too expensive in the state budget. In 1817, Daniel Tompkins, who was governor of New York and transitioning to become vice president of the United States encouraged the state legislature to free the slaves effective um, July 4th of 1827, both those born before 1799 and those born after, and that law did pass. Now, what happened was um, in 1821, um, there was a state constitutional convention. And at that convention, um, this issue of slavery came up. And um, one of the petitions was to have an amendment to the state constitution stating that basically slavery um, was not allowed in New York, but they um, had already freed the slaves effective in the laws of 1817. So some of them didn't want um, that word slavery in the constitution. The language was, we don't want to black in the face of the constitution uh, with slavery. Um, but one of the locals from Schoharie that was at the Constitutional Convention, and Mr. Briggs said, um, they'll know whether we had slavery in New York, whether we blacken the Constitution or not. So it sounds like they're very much um, looking to move forward with um, uh, putting the slavery behind them in New York. However, at that same, same constitutional convention, white males could only vote in New York State if they owned like $100 approximately worth of property. Um, so that constitutional convention, they did away with that. So the white males didn't have to own property. They just had to meet all the other citizen requirements uh, in order to vote. However, they took it upon themselves to uh, impose a $250 uh, property requirement for black males. So black males would have to order, uh, have to own $250 worth of taxable property. So that meant most of your black males could not vote in New York State. The second constitutional convention was around 1846. And here we see a town meeting notice from the black residents of Schoharie going on uh, Spring Street, which was a uh, heavily populated street of blacks in Schoharie in the village. And they're holding a meeting um, to basically push uh, for uh, the right to vote um, and to do away with that $250 uh, requirement. Unfortunately, um, even though um, they were uh, pushing for it, they again had no vote and had no weight and the Constitutional Convention denied um, their right to vote. And this continued until um, the 1867 New York State Constitution after they all fought in the Civil War, and again, they were denied. So it was not until 1870 um, when the US Constitution um, was amended um, that blacks uh, got the right to vote, uh, males that is, in 1870 with the passage of the 15th Amendment, 
um, to the Constitution. But even after emancipation, uh, former slaves were at risk if they went into the southern states. Um, one uh, former slave by the name of Prince Matice uh, from Schoharie County um, ended up down south and basically uh, was uh, arrested and put in jail. Uh, the people of Athens where he was living at the time um, went to see the governor and the governor was away and they said to themselves, we'll get the money up and they raised $80 and sent one of their members down and, and uh, Prince Matisse was released from prison and brought back north. Now, what happened the next year is that this became a real issue and a law was passed uh, authorizing the governor of New York uh, to protect the citizens uh, from being kidnapped or reduced to slavery um, in the South. And this was used in the Solomon Northrop case. And most of you have heard of 12 Years a Slave. Um, that was the story of Solomon Northrop. And Prince Matisse was a previous uh, version, except he was lucky and didn't and get um, kept there for uh, a long period of time, just the time that he was in jail waiting for them uh, to come and rescue them. Now we're gonna talk about the churches fracturing in New York State. Um, this happened uh, a lot in this area. One, the first one um, was Reverend Gilbert McMaster was a minister in the Reformed Presbyterian Church in Duanesburg, which is only about six miles from here. And uh, by legislative resolutions, he said that uh, Congress will ha has the authority um, uh, to abolish uh, slavery and we're pushing our New York legislation to do that. But the Reformed uh, Presbyterian Church didn't want to um, get involved in politics. They felt because the Constitution didn't recognize Jesus as the head of the nation, um, that they shouldn't be involved in voting or public office. Uh, so this agitation on the issue of slavery ended up splitting uh, the Reformed Presbyterian Church um, in 1833. Congressman Briggs of Massachusetts um, was a, approached um, to present some petitions uh, based on the fact that um, there were people sending petitions from all over the country, especially after 1833. Um, 1833 was about when the American Anti-Slavery Society was formed. All of a sudden, there's a flood of petitions coming to the Congress stating that they want, um, you know, no slaves and they want slavery abolished in Washington, D.C. They don't want the, the new states coming into the Union um, to be uh, slave states. So there's a lot of agitation. All this stuff is coming down um, onto Congress. And it's becoming a quite a, a hot point uh, between the North and the South. Um, so one of the Southern um, congressmen uh, by the name of Pickney uh, from the Carolinas um, put up a house rule that uh, any of these petitions that come in um, for slavery to be abolished in DC were to go to a select committee. Um, and then the select committee would basically tell whoever wrote that, that they didn't have the power uh, to abolish slavery in DC. Um, the first time, uh, one of the early times this happened, um, it was um, uh, based on a petition that Mr. Briggs was bringing before uh, Congress and uh, Mr. Wise, a congressman from Virginia said, you know, let's not accept this. And they, um, the, he said, let's take a vote. He didn't want to accept the petition. And um, the Speaker of the House uh, was going to call a vote when it was overruled uh, because they'd already passed this rule. And uh, Mr. Wise was very upset uh, even chewing out his fellow Southern congressman because he had this petition from the Virginia legislature that he wanted to present, um, but was not able to because of this new rule. Uh, these rules became called the gag rules. And we'll see how these gag rules were used also um, in um, the churches. And basically what is interesting about this one in particular is that petition was from Schoharie. One of the interesting things that happened um, in this uh, part of the program over the fracture of the churches is what happened at this church in Stone Arabia um, in Montgomery County um, from the Lutheran uh, Church. It was the installation of Reverend J.D. Lawyer. Um, he was um, an abolitionist uh, member of um, eventually in Sand Lake, New York, where they 
were preaching, uh, but he was appointed to Montgomery County Churches, Stone Arabia, Minden, and Palatine. And Reverend Lintner um, was from Scary Middleburg and Cobuskill. And uh, this is the uh, installation of Reverend Lawyer, um, who was ironically a real lawyer. Um, he was a lawyer um, in Schoharie County, became the county clerk, and then decided he wanted to get into the ministry and became a minister uh, in the Lutheran Church. Shortly thereafter, he became the head of the synod, which was called the Hartwick Synod. Um, it was formed in 1830. Um, and in 1836, one of their members brought a petition um, that they wanted the Lutheran Church to take a stand on slavery. And like taking the cue from the gag laws that we saw in Congress, um, the Synod decided to table it. In fact, there was another motion that they should remain silent on the issue because there was a lot of chances that this would agitate um, and, and split the church or affect um, how the church operated um, when it came to the Lutheran church, you know, in the South. So because they uh, took a, a, a uh, an action of tabling, um, the ones that wanted this petition uh, passed split off because they couldn't see how they could uh, belong to that synod because they felt uh, the church could not remain silent without sinning. In other words, the church needed to take a stand against the evil of slavery. So this group uh, split off from, this, from that synod and formed the Frankian Synod, uh, which was formed in 1837, right after the previous meeting. And it was the first such synod in the United States Lutheran Church uh, that took this stand for slavery. And basically, um, they started to, uh, you know, try and grow their organization and get other uh, churches to join. Reverend John D. Lawyer, who was uh, one of the leaders in this group, um, published in the Friend of Man, which was a local abolitionist paper, um, that the timely action of the Frankian Synod will be a matter of rejoicing to the friends of the oppressed. The minister of this body, Mr. Lawyer says, are all abolitionists. This is the Lutheran Herald that was their newspaper. They also uh, put out a call to all the other Lutheran synods to uh, join them in taking a stand against slavery. The response to that call was very weak. Uh, they ended up being the only synod of their kind for about 20 years. One of the first things that um, Reverend Lawyer did after the formation of the synod was to be appointed um, the head of the synod and also allowed to ordain a clergy. One of the first clergymen he ordained was Daniel Alexander Payne, who was a black man who had been going to the uh, Lutheran uh, Seminary in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. While he was there, um, he was um, told about this synod that was um, in upstate New York and that it might be a place for him to go. Uh, so Daniel Alexander Payne went to um, the Frankian Synod and was ordained by John D. Lawyer. Um, in 1837. Um, because there wasn't a local Lutheran church for him to serve, um, the, at that time, the Lutheran Synod um, included Montgomery, Schoharie, and Rensselaer County for the most part. And in Rensselaer County is the city of Troy. And in the city of Troy, Daniel Ag Alexander Payne found the Liberty Street um, Presbyterian Church or African Presbyterian Church and started um, preaching there. He also later left the Lutherans um, and joined the African Methodist Episcopal Church. He was hesitant to join uh, the AME Church because they frowned upon uh, clergy that had gone to seminary. Um, so he was hesitant to do that, but eventually decided to join um, the AME Church and later became a bishop in the AME Church and the first black president of a college and the president of Wilberforce University um, that was managed by the AME Church. This is a Liberty Street 
uh, Presbyterian Church in Troy, um, where he was preaching in 1837. He also formed a moral um, organization there. And um, it's interesting because um, there's a sign out front about 1840, I believe, that says that uh, Henry Highland Garnett was the first preacher. Well, actually, Alexander Payne was. And we don't know how many years before this, there was actually a Liberty Street Presbyterian Church. It may be that it existed even before Payne got there, but he was followed uh, when he left by Henry Highland Garnett, who was a very famous black abolitionist, and the first black man to uh, speak at um, Congress in the United States. Reverend Philip Whiting was one of the members of the Frankian church that had formed. Um, and he had the towns of Seward and Sharon uh, churches. Now, because of this split in um, from the with the Frankians, um, not all the churches were happy about this. They weren't, they didn't want to be a part of this Frankian uh, synod. Uh, so his two churches, um, he decided he would try and keep the Seward church in his synod and allow the Sharon church to go um, to be with um, the other uh, synod, which was called the Hartwick Synod. But unfortunately, um, the Hartwick Synod decided both those churches were theirs and uh, took it to court and Whiting lost his church. Uh, so he had a large congregation. They built a new church in Gardnersville. And John D. Lawyer, being an attorney, uh, wrote a 20 page dissertation to the judge who had made that decision. Basically, the judge was finding out who were quote unquote, the true Lutherans. And so there was quite a, a disruption here. Um, some of the ministers um, that were in this Frankian Synod were basically people from Schoharie County that started this Synod. They were Ottmans, MPs, Van Alsteins, and lawyers, early names found in Schoharie Valley. One of the other things they wanted to push was missionary work. So they right away started a mission in Sharon, Wisconsin, people from Sharon, New York, went there and were led by Reverend MP, who established a Frankie and Lutheran church there. Again, if they're all abolitionists, this means the abolitionist movement within the Lutheran church is moving outside New York. Reverend Nicholas Van Alstein was another minister who also was involved in the uh, Underground Railroad and was a member of the Frankian Synod. Uh, he took the name as Paul from the Bible um, as his uh, code name and often scriptures and hymns in the church had special meetings for those people in the pews um, so that they knew what um, was going to be happening. Um, his father, unfortunately, was one of the early um, men to suffer the execution on the gallows at Schoharie for the murder of Deputy Huddleston was serving papers for debts owed against the farm uh, that they had owned. The Methodist Church in 1836 passed um, their own um, rules, trying to keep a lid on things. In other words, a gag rule like we saw at Congress, um, in which it advised all ministers and members to wholly refrain from discussing the slavery question. Reverend Luther Lee, um, who is hosting um, his church was a host church for their particular meeting they were having at the conference when one of the members charged him with being an abolitionist. Uh, eventually, um, he was uh, he withdrew the charges, but um, Lee decided with others that they needed to leave the Methodist Church and they formed the Wesleyan Methodist Church in 1843. Luther Lee was its first leader and was an agent of the Underground Railroad. He moved to Syracuse in the spring of 52 and did what he called the largest work of my life on the Underground Railroad. I passed as many as 30 slaves through my hands in a month. And Reverend Luther Lee was born in Schoharie County. John Quincy Adams um, was president of the United States, but at this point he's in Congress, he's serving in Congress. And when um, the gag rule comes into play, it has to be renewed every congressional session. Um, so in between times, he makes sure to get in some of these abolitionist uh, petitions. And uh, there's a couple in these groups that he's presenting, one from the town of Jefferson and one uh, from a little hamlet in Franklinton where 31 people have signed on to this petition that he's bringing before the US Congress. The other Lutheran group we talked about was the Hartwick Synod. Now, Reverend um, 
George Lintner uh, was the minister in Schoharie and he had, um, as we saw before, installed John D. Lawyer, who is now basically his enemy. Um, and they're even trying to steal sheep or take members of his churches away from him. Um, so you would think uh, that he would be a very much an anti-abolitionist, but um, his journal exists and he was for promoting any good work of any of the churches in the area. So um, what's interesting is that um, the, um, there is a, um, an action in 1839 when the, um, there is a meeting of the um, Anti-Slavery uh, Society and um, there's a uh, request uh, has been made in 1839 by a Reverend Cross um, to uh, preach um, in the churches in the Scary Valley and tell them about um, what they're up to. And um, he actually is allowed by George Lintner um, to preach at the um, church in Schoharie. And that's um, quite um, open of Mr. Lintner to allow, you know, basically the people that are cheering, you know, tearing his churches apart uh, to come and preach um, in his church in Schoharie. Now, Reverend Cross was a congregational minister and he was an agent of the New York State Anti-Slavery Society. So he was a full-time abolitionist at this point. So he basically goes um, to Quaker Street, New York in Schenectady County and uh, sends a report in as to what's going on. And he says that he was holding a meeting in Ames, which is just north of Scary County in Montgomery County. And uh, the host backed out that was supposed to allow him to have his meeting. Um, and the minister and the church and the congregation were driven out of the church sanctuary to a barn, which was at once made the place of prayer. Now the abolitionists that were doing these um, preaching sites were very often, you know, they'd throw stones, they'd break into the meetings and try and break them up. They would, um, you know, you know, beat the ministers. They would um, try and set buildings on fire while they're in there. They did all kinds of things to disrupt uh, these abolitionist meetings. So Reverend Cross has been kicked out of the Ames church where he's supposed to be preaching. And then he says, um, at my next appointment, I came to Schoharie. He says, where abolitionists, if not dead, was in such a deep death slumber that I doubted whether anything short of Gabriel's Trump would rouse it into action. After three services on the Sabbath, two of which were especially devoted to the cause of freedom, considered the prospect so unpromising as scarcely to warrant the effort of forming a county society, concluding therefore to let the dead bury the dead without staying myself to attend the funeral. And that's basically what most historians would think would happen in Schoharie, is that that um, would be what he would run into, that um, there would be no interest in hearing uh, about an abolitionist um, and their work. However, he said he was starting for Greene County. Now, Greene County is at the bottom of this map. Um, you can see it's at the southeast um, corner of Scary County. And he's heading for there. And he says, I'm going through Livingstonville, which is to this day a small hamlet in the town of Broome. And he says, accordingly, I visited um, Livingstonville and I found a little leaven, which means he found some something that was going to rise. It's um, another uh, word for... Um, east. And he resolved to make one more effort in Old Schoharie. Accordingly, he visited uh, the principal places in the county and lectured where he could find an opportunity. And yesterday, we organized a Scary County Anti-Slavery Society under more favorable auspices than we could have anticipated from the indications um, where I first arrived. So he's surprised. He goes into Livingstonville and finds that there's an abolitionist group. Of course, it was an abolition. There was an anti-slavery society already in Livingstonville. And there were some active people in that group that encouraged him to try one more time. This is the community church in Livingstonville. Um, James Boyd was an active member here. Um, there was also uh, congregational ministers in the area uh, that were active and um, this is where um, he was when he decided to give them another chance. 
Um, shortly after that, in 1840, we find um, a colored state convention um, that's going to happen in 1840. Now, um, we haven't talked about the black abolitionists, but there was black anti-slavery societies in, in amongst the um, groups in Albany. And uh, Reverend Charles B. Ray um, called a meeting of this colored state convention. Now, some of his white uh, supporters were concerned that of, of an all black um, organizational meeting um, that that might not be a, a, you know, how it might look to the other white people, basically. And uh, he decided to go ahead with that. And basically, when I read the meeting minutes, I thought it was going to be about slavery and it was not. It was about getting the right to vote. They wanted to get the right to vote. So it just shows you how strong uh, in New York um, the feeling was that they needed to do away with this $250 tax, basically, um, so that they could be free to vote. And uh, one of the themes of the meeting was um, who would be free themselves must strike the blow. Charles B. Ray was also a minister um, who married um, Abel Brown, and we'll talk about him in a little bit. Here's uh, one of the meeting um, notices that was in the paper um, that shows who the officers were in Scarry County. We've got Dr. Marinas from Leesville, who was a very uh, adamant abolitionist right to the point of when he died, he left money uh, for, this, for education of blacks. And also uh, Dr. Marinas, um, was a Baptist and was an agent for the Baptist Free Missions. Um, so in 1850, when the Fugitive Slave Law was passed, um, a lot of blacks started moving um, who had settled, you know, they might have come up um, through Albany and then stayed like in Square because there's a large black population. We probably had 600 blacks and less than 30,000 people in the county at that time. Uh, so some of them just stayed here. Um, but if they uh, realized that now they weren't safe, they would start heading for Canada and Dr. Marinas uh, raised over $3,000 in supplies for the slaves that had gone to Canada uh, for their support. Uh, Dr. Van Alstein was a relative of Reverend Van Alstein and was a doctor in Richmondville and Chester LaSalle owned LaSalle Hall, which was a tavern on the main road in Schoharie near Spring Street that we saw before where the black families, one of the sections of the village where the black families lived in Schoharie. Schoharie and Middleburg were the two large black settlements in Schoharie County with hundreds of, of blacks um, in each one of those communities, at least at least 100 in Middleburg and probably two or 300 in the town of Schoharie. Um, in September of 1843, um, Abel Brown and um, Charles Torrey, um, Charles Torrey was known as the father of the Underground Railroad, and Abel Brown was the local um, regional um, organizer for the, they formed the, what was called the Northeastern New York Anti-Slavery Society. And because of the formation, Abel Brown was able to leave his pulpit. He had been a professional abolitionist uh, agent before in Massachusetts and for a year or so took a break um, from wearing himself out by being a preacher in Sand Lake, New York, and um, left the Sand Lake Church to become an abolitionist again at large. And here he's meeting with Charles Torrey, uh, another abolitionist organizer. Now, what's important is to see what Torrey did. Um, in 1842, it organized an elaborate railroad route. So before, you know, that's where you get the organized uh, a part of the Underground Railroad. Previously, you know, the blacks were doing what they could. Um, they would probably be helped out by Quakers. But now you had what was called an organized way of doing this. Um, they sent out agents to these societies that tell them how to operate their societies to promote the abolitionist cause. And I'm assuming also to how to help out the slaves that were coming through. Uh, but those kinds of things, of course, were illegal and weren't, you know, published in the paper. Um, but basically he um, and his assistant Thomas Smallwood, a free black, together they solicited slaves in Washington to run, a, run away and then transported them north uh, to Pennsylvania. And they're mostly um, went to safe houses owned by Quakers. So remember that they were owned by Quakers. A lot of these places they stopped at. And they went from, uh, from there to Philadelphia and Albany and ultimately to Canada. Sometimes they had as many as 15 or 20 slaves um, uh, in a, in a uh, wagon uh, that they took out of the slave states. 
Um, and they, they targeted Southern members of Congress and important political figures so as to cause as much disruption as possible. So now you got, you know, they're poking the tiger. You've got these agents are, are taking some of the cream of the crop uh, slaves from uh, these wealthy slave owners. So you can imagine they're not happy and they're going to take action. Miss Lawrence um, was a um, lady from Schoharie that um, was um, going to help with a mission cause in her hometown. Uh, there was a lot of uh, blacks living there and whites and Aborigines uh, living together with a, they called them slouters in Schoharie County, which was a, a negative term for these mixed race people that lived in the hills around Schoharie. And as a missionary, she was going to open up a Sunday school uh, for the children up there and teach them how to read. Well, she ends up teaching an adult woman named Mary, and she mentions in her, her, um, her biography called Life Sketch um, that this Mary was from the South and appeared to have lived with a family of intelligence and refinement. So here we see a possibility. We see slaves being brought up from the you know, high uh, wealthy congressmen and those types. And then when they get to scary, you know, you've got hundreds of blacks living there and just um, basically blending in um, with them. This would have been in 1840s before the slave, uh, Fugitive Slave Act. Here we see um, the Sand Lake Baptist Church where Reverend Brown was pastor. Um, so, so far we've seen um, by historical references that the Frankian pastors, Nicholas Van Alstein and Dr. James Marinus um, as, were um, probably um, running safe houses as well as Luther Lee who had left Schoharie um, and was operating a safe house out towards Syracuse. And it would strongly appear that Deacon James Boyd, now Deacon Boyd was from Livingstonville, um, as we mentioned, where the leaven was. And um, when his wife died, they had moved to closer to Syracuse. And in Frederick Douglass's paper, um, it published her, her obituary. And in there, it said that she was a special friend of the slave um, and, um, you know, had a scripture reading about, um, you know, her um, helping the least of these, uh, you did it unto me. Um, so basically, it was pretty clear from the obituary that uh, Mrs. Boyd had been assisting the slaves. Um, and again, um, as Dr. Uh, um, Van Alstein, who was a leader of the Frankians and um, Reverend uh, Lawyer, um, Reverend Lawyer said all their ministers are abolitionists. So you can imagine there was a good strong chance that where one of these Frankian ministers was located um, was also um, a place of refuge. From the Capitol, Abel Brown's next appointment was Quaker Street in Schenectady County. And then they're going to Schoharie um, to meet in the courthouse. Now, in some cases, the abolitionists couldn't find a place to meet in the churches, so they would apply and meet in the courthouse. Here in Schoharie, um, um, Abel Brown writes uh, uh, in a letter to his wife um, that they're meeting in Schoharie and that um, Lewis Washington, his associate, um, traveling companion and former slave is giving a talk on what slavery was like um, and really capturing uh, their attention. Um, and he says in his letter that he had to stop writing uh, because of the impact um, the speech was having uh, on him that he could no longer write and had to absorb um, the talk that um, uh, Mr. Washington was giving. Now, uh, Lewis Washington was mainly giving uh, speeches, but he was also uh, sent uh, independently to Scary to help uh, run a meeting. But uh, what is important to, to know is that Abel Brown would promote uh, the Liberty Party, the abolitionist parties at the time. And so he would get you know, stoned and, and thrown out where Lewis Washington, because he was just telling his story, his life story would be allowed to speak. The anti-slavery society split around 1840 because of women's rights uh, not being allowed to speak at the meetings or have a vote. Abel Brown and his group um, were the ones that wanted to see change brought through action um, by political parties and by um, Congress, where the other ones wanted moral persuasion or basically it would just, you know, somehow persuade people that slavery was bad and, 
and should be ending. But Abel Brown was very active um, and they were going to have a Liberty Party meeting in Leesville, which is the other hotbed. We talked about Livingstonville. Leesville is at the opposite end of the county um, and um, was also an abolitionist hotbed. And that's where Dr. Marinus lived. And there was a notice in the paper, is it not time for the abolitionists to arouse themselves and come to this abolitionist uh, political meeting? Now, unfortunately, the two leaders we talked about, Charles Torrey and Abel Brown, uh, died early um, in 1846 and 1844, respectively, both in their 30s. Uh, Charles Torrey, like I said, he was really good. He's a real good organizer. How good was he? Well, they arrested him and threw him in jail for his work uh, down south, and he ended up dying in prison. Um, Abel Brown um, was wearing himself out physically, and while trying to get a place to rest, um, in the bad weather, it got exposure, got to a finally a friendly place he could stay at and weakened and died um, at their home. Um, and so by 1845, the Northeastern um, Anti-Slavery Society is becoming inactive. Uh, so John D. Lawyer and James Marinus get together and they decide they're gonna form a Christian anti-slavery society in Ames. And ironically, Ames is where we had the people thrown out of the church and into a barn. And uh, they're going to have a meeting there um, for the surrounding counties, uh, churches that have a similar view on slavery to meet. And attending that was Reverend Post from the Baptist Church in Leesville and some of the Frankian ministers in Alstein and Ottman. Their next meeting was gonna be in Amsterdam and they were going to draft a protest to be sent to all the churches in New York. Now, what we have to keep in mind is that the Quakers were very active in this anti-slavery movement. And um, they wrote um, in a history of their Society of Friends in New York, uh, that the impartial historian will talk about how uh, the, the overthrow of slavery started uh, through their activities. We talked about Quaker Street, it's in Schenectady. It's only about um, six or seven miles from where I am right now. Um, Ebenezer Wright of Quaker Street was an earnest supporter of the abolitionist party and with John Sheldon, James Sheldon and uh, Mr. Briggs acted as agents for the Underground Railroad assisting slaves on their way to Canon Freedom. And this was published in a double county history um, in 1886. We see in the picture the Quaker Meeting House uh, that was built in 1807. Um, what's significant here is how many agents were in this little town. You've got four. Uh, so it just gives you an idea of the volume. According to Abel Brown in 1842, he had something like 350 slaves uh, went through uh, Albany um, under the Underground Railroad that year. Marjorie Hogue, who wrote a history of the meeting house, um, said that they uh, the slaves came from Queemans and Rensselaerville. Queemans Landing is on the Hudson River uh, below Albany. So they probably came up to Hudson to Queemans and then Rensselaerville. And Rensselaerville is right near um, Livingstonville as well. And um, she says they went up also to uh, Charleston Four Corners. So they would have gone through the Esperance part of Schoharie County and went up um, 162 to Charleston, where there was another Quaker settlement uh, to take these um, former slaves to freedom. Um, this is a historic home from the 1600s in Queemans uh, that they believe may have been one of the safe houses. Um, again, it was on the Hudson River. It was a good location uh, for uh, a safe house on the Underground Railroad. Um, when they came to uh, Quaker Street. Uh, this is this uh, plank house, uh, meaning that it was made with planks. So it's a very thick house or put on top of one another. And then as they're offset, they put the plaster on. Uh, but this house uh, belonged to one of the members of the Quaker meeting that was um, converted this into a, a safe house. And, and she was reporting uh, 1965. Now she, her first writing was in 1944. In 1965, she's saying they came from Queemans and the next place was north of Esperance on their way to Canada. And the north of Esperance would be the Charleston Four Corners, another Quaker settlement. Uh, here is a, a cottage um, gingerbread house in Charleston Four Corners uh, that they think may have been um, a stop on the Underground Railroad. Now, this was not far from the Erie Canal. Uh, we talked about um, 
uh, Reverend Thomas James taking the newly staked trail of the Erie Canal, and this would be just south always of the Erie Canal. Here's a sign for the Friends Meeting. Uh, the Friends Meeting House is no longer uh, standing in the Charleston Four Corners, but there still is a cemetery you can see in the back, background from the Friends Meeting. Now, as you go further up, uh, this house, the Frey House at Palatine Bridge in Montgomery County is on the Erie Canal, uh, backs up to the Erie Canal. Um, now, when you're trying to find a safe house, there's a lot of people that say, you know, their barn, like there's one in Middleburg in Scary County, there's a barn that uh, uh, they found rooms underneath, but they haven't been able to tie it to an abolitionist person or family. Um, so that's some of the things we look for if you're going to try and identify um, a safe house is either it's historically identified as such, or um, they've actually pinpointed um, it based on the fact that there's a family story um, and there's other connections. Now in the Fry House, now this is F-R-E-Y, it's pronounced Fry. The Fry's came to uh, New York in 1688. Um, they were from Switzerland um, and the family stayed there in this, uh, they had an old house that they built along the Hudson and uh, replaced it in 1739 and it became a fort. That building is still there. Around 1808, they had more money and they built this nice house uh, closer to the road. And this is the house as a tunnel uh, running down to the Erie Canal and the Mohawk River. Here we see a picture of the basement of the house and the arrow points to an opening um, that I actually crawled into. Um, and it goes only a short ways um, and hits the a foundation wall, but on your left is a short wall and there is an oil tank. In the 1980s, uh, the oil furnace was put in um, and blocked the exit from the house into the tunnel that leads out. Now, according to the landscapers, there's still an entrance um, you can get to from the Mohawk River into the basement of this house. Now, what is interesting about this is not just this story about the tunnel, is the fact that John Fry, um, who lived here, was the vice president of the New York State Anti-Slavery Society. So here we've got, you know, a story that was on there. We've got evidence of a tunnel uh, leading to the Mohawk River and the Erie Canal. And we also know that the person owning this was an officer in the anti-slavery movement. This is the inside of the house. Um, I was given a tour recently, and this is a historic mantelpiece in the home. And if you'll carefully, you'll see down halfway down the sides there, it says 1688 on one side, 1888 on the other. Um, this was put in on the 200th anniversary of the family coming to America from Switzerland. Now, if we get a close up of that um, mantelpiece in the center, we see on the left um, a symbol for Switzerland. The flag has, a, I believe, a red cross on it and the Swiss knife, and we see a boat in the water. But what is really interesting is the German words that are on this, which is ich bin frei. Now, F-R-E-I and F-R-E-Y, the family name, are both pronounced frei, but ich bin frei means I am free. And this doesn't mean I'm free like I can do what I want or I, you know, I've got time to do things. It means you're free from something in the German language, free from prison, or in this case, possibly free from slavery. The other um, part of that history of Schenectady County, while uh, we talked about um, the lady from that wrote the history of the Quaker Meeting House, Mrs. Hogue, um, we also um, found the history of the um, Quakers uh, in the history of Montgomery or Albany and Schenectady counties. And in that history it goes on to say, um, after Quaker Street, the next station west was the house of Mr. Griggs, a miller at Schaheri. And John P. Griggs was born in 1797 in the town of Esperance, operated a ferry um, near Sloansville. And, um, the, and the censuses show him in the town of Carlisle. But eventually, around 1844, he purchases a Peter Vroman house in Mills. Ironically, this is the same house where he talked about the, the slave girl getting kicked down the stairs and uh, hitting her head against the masonry and dying. 
But now um, it's a safe house. And uh, when it was advertised for sale in 1860, they said there were three families could fit in here. And when Mr. Griggs lived there, he did have about three families and he had an active mill business. Uh, but this was identified as a safe house um, on the Underground Railroad, right in Schoharie, um, where we thought there would never be um, any kind of uh, abolitionist type underground railroad activity. Here's a uh, artistical drawing gives you an idea. The yellow house in the foreground is the Roman house and you see the stone fort historic building in the background. Um, Sharon Springs, uh, of course we saw Leesville um, which was an earlier settlement at Sharon Springs, but Sharon became an abolitionist hotbed. Um, basically, they, they said that uh, during a political uh, campaign um, that if um, the uh, abolitionists were having a meeting and there was a thousand people showing up and then they were going to have a democratic meeting and they said there wouldn't be enough people uh, to raise a liberty poll, which meant uh, each political party uh, raised a poll, made a wood, the liberty party, um, the, the Democrats used a hickory poll and basically it said there would only be a, not enough people to even put the poll up and they would put their banner on there. But um, so it's likely that there was another route that was coming from um, what we call the Lunenburg Turnpike, which runs like from Rensselaerville, we talked about Livingstonville up through Richmondville towards Sharon. Um, where we know there was strong abolitionist activity and James Marinus was said to have been uh, ma managing a, a safe house as well. Before 1850, you'd not be surprised to see the slaves settle in Scary, but after 1850, some of them probably uh, started to move on. In one letter we have from 1842, a, a gentleman who was studying to be an attorney in Middleburg says that he was surprised that it was inhabited by a, a great number of Negroes, there were probably nearly 100 in this village, meaning Middleburg, and Schoharie was a much larger black population. Here on this map, we see um, some of the areas we've been talking about. Um, you can see where Queemans over on the right is on the Hudson River in Albany County. Um, and then you see coming over to the left um, in Albany County is Rensselaerville. And then in the town of Broome, we see Livingstonville, Franklinton. Um, and then if you head up at a diagonal, um, you'll be going through Richmondville uh, to Leesville. Now, if you head straight north from Rensselaerville, um, you'll head towards Quaker Street, and Quaker Street is where they would go through Esperance and up to Charleston Four Corners and then up uh, to the Erie Canal. So you could either go up the Erie Canal or take, um, if Sharon is on the Great Western Turnpike, you could either take the Turnpike, head west, um, through New York or um, head on to the Erie Canal. The early uh, poems and stories of those times talk about Niagara Falls. So it seems like a lot of the slaves went through uh, and crossed Canada at Niagara Falls, or they left Albany and went through Rensselaer County and went up to Vermont and, and up through Canada that way. I think that ends um, what I have for you today. Um, the, the attachment you'll get later, and we'll have a lot of detail about people that were involved in the area on the Underground Railroad. So I guess I'll open it up now to our questions, um, if we have any, and um, I'll ask our host to um, read all the questions that uh, have come up. Any maps that exist? Um, this is kind of a new territory we're exploring today. Um, there hasn't been a lot of, of um, deep dive research um, in this area because it was just assumed because of the strong democratic presence that there wasn't much activity here. Okay. Um, are all of the safe houses preserved as historic buildings? Most of the safe houses we looked at today are all private residences and they are being preserved by their owners uh, but they are all um, they are all private residences. Uh, were the anti-slavery societies mostly associated with the Lutheran Church? No, the Lutheran Church uh, ministers felt they were their own anti-slavery society. 
So there are two different groups. You had the anti-slavery society uh, members and you had the Lutheran church members. And basically there are two separate uh, groups, uh, John D. Lawyer and those, those people felt they, the church was itself an anti-slavery uh, society. So we have a person that grew up in Sharon Springs. They wanted to know if there was any connection uh, to the Beekman House, which is at the Beekman Mansion out uh, on the edge of the town. I, I've not heard of anything, have you? Uh, Judge Beekman was a slaveholder. Um, I don't know um, that there's uh, after him. I don't, from what I understand, it wouldn't be him that would have been uh, harboring slaves because he had them. Um, he, I think, what did he die in 1830s, I think? Yes. Um, and I don't know who had it after him, but I'm not aware of that. Okay. They want to know if they can tour the Underground Railroad, uh, if there's a map of which is, uh, there is not. And the, like, for instance, the home that we were showing uh, in, uh, in the Palatine Bridge is not these are all private residents, so they're not open to the public. It's just um, I happen to know the lady that owns the house, and so uh, Ken and I were able to go in. And uh, in that case, it's it's just a really interesting house, and it's wonderful that so much of it has been preserved. It's unfortunate that the tunnel has been blocked because when they put that um, oil tank in, they ended up blocking the uh, the passageway. But you can come from the Riverside, and it's very obvious where the uh, tunnel goes because in the summer the grass doesn't grow over. Uh, it's just kind of a brown spot where the the tunnel is underneath. What's the distance between Schoharie County and Montgomery County? Um, I'm um, where I sit in Esperance. I'm probably about um, two or three miles from the county line. So. Um, uh, Sharon Springs, again, you're very close to the county line, and Leesville is very close to the county line in Montgomery County. So Ames, we talked about Ames. Ames and Leesville are very close to each other. Did the Fugitive Slave Act have an effect, uh, let's see, make the slaves move out to Canada? So yes. Um, when uh, the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, uh, panic, I, from what I can understand, took place. And um, our friend Alexander Payne, the bishop of the AME Church, got together with Frederick Douglass, and they're going to cite, should we tell people to stay or tell people to run uh, to Canada? Because some of the leaders, of the black leaders, that is, of the abolitionist movement had already left for Canada. So there's a mass exodus, apparently around 1850, uh, where people had been comfortable in the northern states and were no longer comfortable and headed for Canada. Do you have information on the Underground Railroad in other parts of New York? This person grew up uh, between Binghamton and Elmira, uh, right on the New York-Pennsylvania border. Uh, they've heard of houses in the towns there and like to, that were likely part of the Underground Railroad. Now, there is an Underground Railroad website, isn't there, for uh, in New York? Right. In Peterborough, there's a Abolitionist Hall of Fame museum where Smith lived. Um, so that organization there probably has a lot on it. Um, the Capital Region has an Underground Railroad uh, Society, and they're preserving uh, Mr. Myers' home, who was a Black um, abolitionist and a Black leader in the abolitionist movement. Um, so there are other um, historical groups that are dedicated uh, to this topic that may have uh, more detailed information of other regions. Did the Fugitive Slave Act affect the fleeing slaves or the free black folks? Um, it affected uh, the slaves because um, what happened was um, they were being forced, all the uh, people in the states by law were supposed to help capture a fugitive slave in their town. Now, what happened was they didn't obey the law. And in Troy and other places, there were famous incidences where um, in the courtroom, the uh, black slave would be, uh, all of a sudden something would happen and they'd hustle the slave out of the courtroom and, and send him to freedom. Uh, so basically what was happening was um, by law, 
all of the free white people and uh, free blacks were supposed to help uh, capture runaway slaves that were in their territory. The Synod at Hartwick Seminary is mentioned. Uh, how did this come into play with other area abolitionists? Uh, I think it was mentioned, but I didn't connect the dots. Um, Hartwick Seminary uh, was built by the Hartwick Synod of the Lutheran Church. And basically the Hartwick uh, Lutherans were those that did not want to rock the boat, so to speak, and make a big issue out of slavery, but rather keep quiet about it so that churches don't split, where the Frankians were part of that. Uh, John D. Lawyer was the leader of, this, of the um, Hartwick Synod at the time, and basically he, um, um, he was the one that uh, led the split. But as far as a region around Hartwick, uh, Mr. Ottman, one of the Frankian ministers, his son, I think, was going to school out there and was the leader of the anti-slavery society out by Hartwick Seminary. So they did have, you know, people. In fact, I think at one time um, the church there um, was being taken over by the Frankians and it was a very contentious thing where they had uh, you know, this going on between the, the ones that wanted to keep it quiet and the ones that wanted to agitate the subject. It said, did fugitive slaves find work or transportation on the Erie Canal? Uh, fugitive slaves would probably have followed the canal. I don't know um, um, if they could find work or not. Um, it depended on who they were with. And it, again, it depends on how organized uh, the anti-slavery society was. In other words, it's possible they had a ship's captain on one of the boats that would allow them, you know, to ride the boat up the canal. Um, and again, it depended on the organization. And if you follow some of these other um, histories of the anti-slavery uh, movement uh, written from other regions of the state, which do exist, um, you'll, you'll read more about it and find out how uh, the slaves were continued on the canal or went, you know, west on, on the highway. Uh, but I imagine most of the time they tried to go when they weren't going to be obviously seen. Okay. Well, that looks like that's the end of the questions. Uh, and I really appreciate your time, Ken, and thank you for uh, you know, sharing such, uh, uh, such an interesting program. Uh, if you want to contact Ken, there's his email address. Uh, we are going to be, this, this presentation was recorded. It will be put on the Historical Society website. You'll receive an email once that's up. Uh, it will give you access to the recording of this presentation, as well as Ken has prepared a uh, supporting document that you can uh, you can uh, read at your your leisure. Our next programs coming up are March 8th and March 22nd. It's Railroads in Schoharie County. Uh, it's presented by Bob Holt. And then there's a program on the Wild West, Miners, Cowboys, Gunslingers, Saloon Madams, and Ghost Town. So I will be presenting that presentation on the 22nd. Those are available for registration and you will receive links to those. Um, if you haven't already, you should have received an email. Uh, it was sent out a little bit ago. And uh, yeah, here's the upcoming presentation. So you can see we've got a quite a variety, everything from uh, we've got some quilts, um, history preserved in quilts. We have history of ice cream, the story of the Statue of Liberty, um, a Jewish life in Sharon Springs, story of the Adler Hotel, uh, just uh, and the assassination of John F. Kennedy 58 years later. So we have in Santa Claus in December. So we have uh, quite a bit uh, uh, coming up in the next several months. And since you registered on this or for this presentation, you'll get an auto automatic email from Eventbrite when these are available. And there's the information for the Historical Society. Again, we apologize for the problem that we had, uh, we did purchase adequate licenses for the people, but for some reason, Zoom just would not allow us to get in. So thank you everyone for your participation tonight. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at the, the next presentation. And, and thank you again, Ken, for your time to uh, present tonight. 
You're welcome, Ron. Thanks for having me. Okay. Have a good evening, everyone.